Today we have world-renowned jeweler and silversmither Shane Hendren. He has won the... the I'm the only four-time artist of the year. Okay, the only four-time artist of the year. He's Navajo, he's the epitome of cowboy, and we have him here today, and we're gonna talk about what he is, what the creative cowboy means to him, and the creative economy. Um. I didn't start out to be a jeweler and that's what I've been doing now for 30 years is primarily making jewelry. Um, as a kid growing up, I, uh, I was around art my whole life. My, uh, my, my mom is from the Navajo reservation and as a small child, we lived on the reservation and, um, uh, my dad traded on the reservation and everything. And, and I can remember, uh, as a kid, you know, guys would come <clears throat> knock on my parents' door and, uh, you know, they'd have paintings or jewelry or whatever that they wanted to sell to my dad. A lot of them were cowboys, you know, so they could make entry fees or gas money or whatever. And, um, and he would buy them. And then he would turn around and take these things that he bought from these guys and uh, go to like uh, the Grand Canyon, for example and resell it to the gift shop there. And then they would they would sell it. Or he would come to Santa Fe and, you know, go to different galleries and, and sell the artwork to, to the galleries. So he was like, he was a middleman in the process. And so what that taught me as a young child was, I didn't want to be one of those guys because they were the epitome of starving artists. You know, when I look back on it, I feel like a lot of them, they probably didn't hardly cover the cost of their materials. They damn sure didn't cover the, their time, you know, with what they were selling stuff for because they were selling work to my dad at a price point that was low enough that he could resell it to another middleman. So everybody's making a profit as this thing, before this thing finally gets to the collector and uh, where they pay the ultimate price. And, uh, I think a lot of these guys, the other thing back then that I saw was they were totally unaware of where their art went. You know, they, they didn't realize that what they were making was going out there into the great big world and it might end up in Europe or Asia or, you know, they were just, they had this innate ability to draw or paint or make jewelry or whatever, and they produce something. And that's as far as it goes. That's as far as their thought process goes, is they have an idea, they make something, and then that's it. How do I say this? I get, I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, because it's kind of funny, like in, in the cowboy world, you don't want to ask people how many cows you own or how many acres you have or anything like that. It's just poor form, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but what, what a lot of ranch people will ask you is, you know, well, how many generations have you guys been doing it? And, um, it's kind of like a qualifier, figure out, you know, how legit you are. And I always like to tell people, well, the Spanish brought them and my ancestors started stealing. That's how long we've been in the livestock business. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's not really a joke because that's really about how it went. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, uh, in my family, we know none of us has ever been made to be a cowboy. In, in our family, everybody's encouraged to follow their own path, do their own deal. Um, when I was a kid growing up though, um, and still today, I can't imagine ever being or doing anything else. I mean, um, not just because of who it's who I am, it's because, uh, I don't know how to explain it. In my lifetime, there's only been all together, maybe four years that I didn't have horses. 
and out of my lifetime, those are probably four of the shittiest years of my life. Even though I don't ride them horses every day and everything, they they bring a sense of uh, meaning to my life, you know. Because um, interestingly enough, my kids, you know, they're the reason why I do everything I do. Like, when I found out I was going to have a son, I, I changed my entire life to be the best dad I could be. And part of that included uh, figuring out how I was going to live so that my kids could have opportunities, but they didn't, they wouldn't feel like they had to be something they weren't. When I was growing up, um, I've got uh, three brothers and a sister, but in the beginning it was just the three of us, mostly. And uh, my middle brother, Haas, was a, is still a phenomenal rider. I mean, he could ride anything. He, he, was, he was our top bronc rider at the house when we were starting colts and everything. He was our test pilot. He's real good, but he didn't want nothing to do with cowboy stuff. He wasn't interested in it. He liked motorcycles and rock and roll music and, you know, raising hell and kicking ass. That was his deal, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But because my parents, you know, were in the livestock business, we were essentially slave labor. So, you know, he didn't have any choice but to do it. And I think, I think that created a resentment in him that, you know, he rebelled against it even more. And, uh, so he's not, he's not a cowboy per se. Mm -hmm. And then my brother, Philip, he, uh, my mom and dad themselves weren't ranching anymore by the time he was like a teenager. And uh, my brother, Philip, he was always involved with livestock and everything. And he still is, he still got a little bunch of cows in Nebraska and everything. And he'll always have them, in fact, uh, He's provided uh, show steers for my daughter over the years and everything. When I was born, my, uh, my great grandfather told my mom, um, he, he essentially told my mom, he said, this one's gonna be a cowboy. And my mom just kind of laughed. At the time, my mom swore up and down. She was done with cowboys. She wasn't gonna marry no cowboys. She didn't need no cowboys. Although my mom was probably at the time one of the best cowboys I'd ever known. She's still pretty, pretty handy. But uh, I guess in that respect, I didn't have any choice. It was, you know, it was a foretold prophecy, you know, that it was gonna be that way. But, um, but growing up, I just, uh, I don't know. It's all I ever wanted to do. I mean, still, really, I mean, like when I talk about retirement, quote unquote, my my idea of retirement is I want a small enough ranch that I can manage it myself and I don't need nobody to help me, quote unquote. <laughs> and uh, I want to be able to I want to be able to sit on my back porch in the evening and and look at my good horses and my good cows and, you know, smoke a cigar and have a glass of whiskey and, you know, be done. You know, and I never thought about being old until, until my son passed. And then it really made me think, you know, I gotta, I'm going to get old. <laughs> I guess to understand like how deep my roots are, it's, uh, my, on my dad's side of our family, we go all the way back to Ireland and, uh, you know, the Irish people are livestock people and horse people. And in our family history, um, there's a lot of people on my dad's side of the family. They've had ranches and farms. I mean, of course they had farms and stuff. Um, you know, prior to the Civil War, they had plantations and things. And uh, it, it was always there. And uh, 
my uh, my granddad raised world champion quarter horses and so uh, by default i grew up with good horses i just you know it's uh it's sort of one of them deals where whatever you grow up around it you learn it by osmosis i guess it, it just is who you are and uh, and then on my mom's side of the family um my uh both sides of my mom's family they uh and on my dad's side too they were they were all livestock people but on my mom's side my great-grandfather robert holion he uh he worked for the railroad he was an ice cutter so in the winter time he'd go back to the great lakes where they cut the ice off of the Great Lakes because back then refrigeration was they put big chunks of ice, you know, in a box and that's what kept your stuff cold. So when the Great Lakes would freeze in the wintertime, these guys would cut ice and store it in these giant warehouses full of sawdust. And then part of the, the industry was they would ship it via rail across the country. They would ship ice, but ice cutters were employed during the wintertime. So my great grandfather would go to the Great Lakes, cut ice throughout the winter. And while he was up there, he became acquainted with the farmers and people that were in that part of the country. And, uh, and he was already raising cattle and horses and everything, but he would take whatever money he managed to make and go buy registered Hereford bulls and go buy registered Rambouillet rams or, you know, register quarter horses after when, when the quarter horse association yeah. started but he would take and spend his money to buy the best stock that he could and he would ride the train with them back to Gallup and then at Gallup he would take them to Tohatchee and, and he did that for many years to improve up his stock you know and every opportunity that there was to improve his livestock he did it and so because I had a granddad on my dad's side that raised world champion quarter horses and he understand he understood bloodlines and he understood, you know, breeding and, you know, crossing to get a, a nick that filled a special need. We, uh, he, he always raised, he raised working cow horses. He wanted a working horse. He wasn't looking for those, uh, bubble butted halter horses that they had back in the seventies. He wanted a horse with a good foot and leg, something that had some cow in him that was athletic, you know, that that had a good mind that you could get around on and he wasn't going to buck you off that kind of thing. And, uh, and then my great grandfather, you know, he was, he also had good horses, but he wasn't as heavily into the horses as he was the cows. And, you know, he was in that high desert country. Our family had a ranch at Chaco Canyon, as well as on top of the Chushka mountains and it, on the flats at uh, Tohatchee. So you had to have a cow that could cover country. You had to have a cow that, you know, maximize their grass intake and, and be able to take long walks between water because that's just the nature of the, of the land. My mom is, uh, or I should say was, like an encyclopedia of quarter horse breeding when I was a kid growing up. And I can remember as a child her and my granddad sitting around talking about all these different bloodlines and you know what horses to cross on what and you know which was going to give you this that or the other you know what characteristics this stud would pass down to its foals and everything and it was weird because back then you know the only way you got that information was a quarter horse journal or by going to shows or by talking to people and and my granddad used to take me with him when he'd be showing horses in the summertime. He was a teacher, so when school was out in the summer, he'd haul his own horses to shows, even though he had a professional trainer that trained for him and everything. He'd still go to shows, and he would take me. And I can remember listening to these guys talk about this stuff, you know. And uh, it really was impactful to me because it helped me to understand that when you take this and this and you combine them, you're hoping that you get the best attributes of both so that you end up with this. 
and you're always striving to make something better, to create something better as you go. And uh, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But if that's always your intention, then, you know, that's a pretty cool deal. And then my mom, like growing up, my mom and dad ranched when I was a kid. It was the same kind of thing. You know, my mom and dad had pretty much a, a, a baseline Hereford herd of cattle. And I remember uh, one year my dad brought in Charlet bulls because he was trying to get the best attributes of those big Charlets bred into that herd of cows. Another year he brought in black bulls, you know, and, you know, because the trend was going towards them black baldies and, you know, black was worth a few more cents a pound than, than red and everything. And, uh, the most important thing that anyone ever taught me was that at the end of the day, we weren't in the cow business and we weren't in the horse business. We were in the grass business. And if you didn't take care of your grass, then you were bankrupt. You were out of business. And it was, uh, my dad's grew up in Oklahoma. So we'd go back to Oklahoma to see my great grandparents all the time. And, uh, you know, we'd go to relatives places around there and everything. And they'd have 500 acres. And on that 500 acres, they'd have 500 cows. And I always ask myself, why the hell do we live in the desert? <laughs> what, why are we killing ourselves in the desert? <laughs> and I never did get an answer. Nobody ever told me, but you know, we, uh, we had 17 sections in hell. We could only run 250 head of mama cows year round, you know? <laughs> That's a lot of country. <laughs> Quote unquote cowboys came in every size and shape. It's not an exclusive uh, job of one group of people or another. And, you know, just like there's 10 ways to skin a cat, well, there's 10 ways to work a cow. And whichever one works for you that day is the right way. <laughs> um, but no, it's uh, I, social media, you know, has brought that to light. But the other thing that social media has done for us in how it has uh, helped agriculture. And I hope that people take advantage of this. I, w I want people to show people the, the passion they have and, and, the work they put in to raise the livestock they do to feed not just this country but the world and i want them to do it in such a way that the consumer understands that they're not getting their due they deserve more and and help to educate them to support those small producers when i started learning and meeting other artists and seeing things and then other older artists started advising me and uh and i kept hearing over and over about not getting caught in the trap you know and i was like okay what is the trap and it, it was like well you know these galleries they want to get you under contract and then they own you and then you know they'll they'll loan you money and everything but then you don't realize they're charging you interest and it, you end up upside down and now you're giving them all your paintings for free because you owe them or whatever. And, and I, and I would always look back and I'd be like, you know, that is a screwed up system because I know all these artists, world famous artists who were broke, you know, living in apartments or, you know, sleeping on somebody's couch or whatever. But the gallery owner had a Mercedes and lived in a freaking mansion, you know? Yeah. And, and I thought to myself, I, I don't want to be that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I listened to what these guys were telling me. <clears throat> I was very naive. And, uh, I went to school at the Institute of American Arts in 1989. And, uh, to tell you how naive I was, I'll, I'll put it like this. Everybody said, you got to do Santa Fe Indian Market. And I was like, what the hell is Santa Fe Indian Market? And here, you know, it had been the biggest show for Indians ever, still is. And they're like, you know, 
if you want to be a legit artist, you got to do Santa Fe Indian Market. And I was like, well, how do you, how do you do it? And they said, well, you got to apply. So I applied and, you know, and I didn't even try hard and I got in mm -hmm. and, you know, I showed up late and I had a great show and I thought it was all, you know, rock and roll and rodeo from there on. <laughs> Never had another poor day. S Silver Sun uh, Gallery in Santa Fe it used to be on Kenyon Road. Deanna Olson was the owner. And um, she had a deal on one of her uh, countertops that was an IACA brochure. And well, she had a bunch of them because IACA used to make these brochures about how to buy Indian art, what to look for, all these different things. And she had, uh, she had these brochures from IACA on her countertop. And uh, I'm a visual person. They had cool pictures on them and everything. Mm -hmm. And I used to, if it was free, I was collecting it and looking at it, whatever it was. And so I picked these brochures up and I was looking at them. And then I got to look at what is this IACA business, you know? And, and then I got to looking around and I realized that there were certain artists that were quote unquote IACA artists of the year. And they were all people that I admired and respected. And so then I started asking, well, how do you win artist of the year? How do I become artist of the year? And they're like, well, you have to join the Indian Arts and Crafts Association. And I was like, okay. And you know, that was just one thing running into another thing. And um, so I started looking into joining the organization. I was asked if I would run for an office on the board. And um, it kind of, kind of took me back to high school and FFA, you know, 4-H and it's like, man, you know, it's one thing to be a board member, but to be an officer, that's a lot of freaking work, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was, and I was working, I was doing a lot of my own work at the time and my kids were rodeoing and everything. I had plenty of stuff on my plate, but, but I, I asked myself, you know, if I don't do this, who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. And if I don't do this, Who's going to represent me, you know? So the number of artists that were like me, that all I did for a living was art, is a very, very tiny percentage of the industry. And for a guy like me, it was ultra important that the best be done for the industry if I was going to survive. And when I joined the board and when I, did, when I told them, yes, I'll run for office, I told them I'm doing this 100% selfishly because if I succeed, we all succeed. If we can keep, keep the Shane Hendren boat floating, then every other boat will be, be yeah, because, because I'm in the toughest position as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have nobody propping me up. It's all, it's either sink or swim. You know, it's like the story of my life. I was, you know, I'm in it to win it and I'm all in it.